Just yeah, do that. Let's okay. Do that. So that um, I'll, I'll, I'm in touch with Gibran, so we, we should be able Excellent. to. Excellent. Okay. All right. So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Mahlaka Sambani. I'm director at the Community Alliance for Peace and Justice. On behalf of the Community Alliance and our partner, the Pakistan Question, I'd like to welcome you all to our event today. The Community Alliance is an advocacy group that impacts policy and public opinion on matters related to South Asia and the Middle East. We do this through congressional engagement, policy analysis, and mass media campaigns. The Pakistan Question is a Pakistani-American nonpartisan forum which fosters discussion on U.S. public policy on Pakistan. It engages experts from both countries, facilitating enhanced understanding and collaboration. So, as is obvious, we are currently going through a very critical moment in Pakistan's political history with fast-moving developments on the ground. Pakistan held a historic and landmark election on February 8th amid widespread claims of pre-poll rigging and pervasive reports of election fraud after the votes were cast. Despite this, the Pakistan Tehrike Insaf backed independent candidates emerged as the group with the most votes in parliament. Despite trailing in the polls, the PMLN, which was backed by the military, and is at least widely believed to be backed by the military, and the PPP are now on their way to form a governing coalition, um, although it might be a weak and an unstable one. PTI mm -hmm. leaders in key constituencies um, who were defeated have challenged their results in court. And as many of you might know, today the commissioner of the garrison town of Rawalpindi resigned after admitting to manipulating election results and in the process implicated the election commission and a senior judge of the Supreme Court. Of course, he has yet to provide evidence of that involvement. At the same time, numerous congressional representatives here in the U.S. have issued statements and tweets calling on the Biden administration to not recognize the results of the election until all irregularities have been resolved. So very broadly speaking, this is where we are nine days after the election. We are here to take stock and examine what this election means for the future of democracy in Pakistan. Um, for the impact it will have on civil military relations, on US-Pakistan dynamics. And also we want to know how we in the diaspora, the Pakistani Americans here in the US and other parts of the world, what we can do to make a difference and advance democracy back home in Pakistan. So to respond to these questions and more, we are joined today by an incredible panel of speakers who need absolutely no introduction. However, I will introduce them briefly. So first we have Mr. Muhammad Gibran Nasser, a renowned social justice advocate who specializes in criminal and constitutional law with a focus on fundamental human rights. He is currently actively involved in representing those candidates who believe they were victims of election fraud. Next, we have Mr. Vajahat Saeed Khan, who is an Emmy-nominated journalist and author reporting on Indo-Pacific security and focusing on the Afghanistan-Pakistan conflict. He is also an adjunct fellow at NYU Center of Global Affairs and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Last but not least, we have Dr. Muid Pirzada, who is a prominent geostrategic analyst, TV anchor, columnist, and blogger currently based in Washington, D.C. He has written extensively for national and international publications, including Dawn, The Tribune, Khalij Times, etc. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all our speakers today. Um, before we begin, however, I'm just going to quickly go over the format of today's discussion. So um, for the first 45 minutes or so, I'm going to ask our speakers a series of very broad questions, after which we will open it up to audience Q&A. Um, and that part will be mod moderated by myself and Shahriyar Manavar of the Pakistan Question. I should also say at this time that Vajahat Khan, one of our speakers, is live streaming this on um, his channel. So um, that is uh, also one way to watch it. So with that, and without further ado, I am now going to begin. Um, so Gibran, let me start with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, so, thank you for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. So Gibran, on February 8th, right, we had this incredible moment where millions of people came out to vote, defying all odds, and despite all of the pre-election rigging, despite all of the voter suppression, voter intimidation, they delivered an astounding upset. It was almost as if 
um, the people of Pakistan had staged a civilian coup against the Pakistani military. How do you think the Pakistanis see this moment? Do they feel incredibly empowered by what they had delivered at the polls? Or given the massive sort of claims of post-election rigging, do you think that they're going to be pretty much disillusioned with the with the democratic process in Pakistan? In my opinion, two things have happened on February. I believe there are two kinds of voters, if we can largely divide them in two groups. One we can say is the PTI voter, and the other is the People's Party and the Noon League voter. Uh, those who are uh, having a relatively much better time uh, since the formation of the PDM government. And what we saw is that the PTI voter felt extremely charged, ex felt extremely determined, despite what had happened to the party uh, in the past six months and came out to vote. And it also appeared that the Noon League voter and the People's Party voter, especially in the urban areas and in, for most part of Punjab, was not as charged or determined. So. As PTI enjoyed a strong wave of support, having an anti-establishment stance, I believe uh, the, P the People's Party voter and the Noon League voter had a sense of dejectment, given how close these parties were with the establishment. And we've seen in the past as well, that whenever a political party has aligned itself uh, in an anti-establishment position, for example, in the, in the, the year 2020 or 2021, when uh, you could not say the name of Mariam Nawaz or Nawaz Sharif on television or the, or the speeches or the uh, protests were not being shown, um, their popularity was swelling in Punjab. But as soon as uh, the narrative of PTM changed and it sided with the establishment, it started to lose popularity. So what has by far been a uh, clear outcome is that the people in Pakistan want a government by the people and for the people. And they are not so much thrilled about these continuous interventions and uh, pre-planned setups, uh, which are being made th through unelected offices. Great, thank you for that. Thank you for that opening um, statement, Gibran. Um, I'm now going to turn to Vajahat. Um, Vajahat, how will this election um, and its aftermath impact the military going forward? Um, as Gibran mentioned, you know, <clears throat> many believe this to be an anti-establishment vote. Do you believe that this was a moment of reckoning for the military leadership. Will this compel the establishment to recalibrate its explicit role in the political process? And how will this impact civil military relations over the short and medium terms? Excellent question. I think that question is the uh, 750,000 man question, because that's the size of the world's fifth largest military, and that's the military we had. Um, I, there's an old saying they teach at the staff college in Quetta, which is what every general has to get through before he becomes a general. He has to pass that course as a major and hopefully pass it well. And uh, there's, a, there's an old saying they have there saying the only thing more difficult than putting a new idea into an army is taking an old idea out of it. They use that as a joke uh, for the students to stick to uh, traditional methodology. Here's the thing. Um, militaries are essentially conservative institutions. Uh, that's what, uh, uh, it's not just the Pakistani military, any major military in the world uh, is designed to be conservative. Uh, it's for discipline. Uh, progressive uh, instincts are discouraged because progressive instincts lead to digressions from the chain of command. Um, creativity, uh, you want to be creative, go join the Navy right? <laughs> Go for a swim. Uh, you're not, especially, especially armies are specifically designed for that just because of the way they're structured. Um, this military's uh, strength and weakness is its discipline. Its strength is also its weakness. It's not like the Middle Eastern militaries, which uh, have seen a lot of colonel coups, um, which have seen um, uh, countries like Syria and Iraq effectively uh, blow up because of indisciplined uh, organizations. Um, so that's a good thing uh, in the sense that the militaries stayed together through the years. That's also a bad thing when it comes to chain of command and illegal orders and unlawful orders and leadership. Um, it seems that we're going through that sort of moment. Uh, it's unfair to just sweep the whole military under the, uh, with the and paint it with the same brush. Um, the military does great work. It's doing great work right now, this very minute, 
um, hundreds of thousands of Pakistan army soldiers, sailors, and airmen are at work defending that country. They're doing an important job. They are not involved in the political process. As we speak right now on four of our most dangerous, difficult borders in the world. Um, so it's unfair to, to plug the military with what the intentions of a small cabal of general officers is up to. These general officers are not, are not accountable to the military. They're not accountable to us. They're not accountable to anyone. So I would ask you to please rephrase the question. Uh, what is the military leadership going to do? I think that's a very different question from what the military is going to do. Now, the good thing is that the military is going to do exactly what the military leadership wants to do, right? And in a way, that's a good thing. It's also a bad thing because tomorrow, if the military leadership says, all right, there's enough chaos, as we have seen, the last few hours have been nothing but full of chaos, um, they just might end up doing, and now people are starting to war game um, the worst. People are starting to war game military interventionism, uh, an emergency, uh, other terrible measures which Pakistan has seen before. But overall, I would say um, that the military is very thick-skinned. Um, we've known it to operate under strenuous circumstances. It's done this before. It has it done it in an age where it's been so transparent and brazen? No. Um, the military has come in before. It's done these what it's been up to before. But this time, the show is on for millions of people to see on live stream, as we as you can see right now, that's the difference. Now, is it rubbing them the wrong way? I'm not sure, um, but I do feel that a reckoning is coming. Whether it's going to be an extreme act or some sort of uh, um, um, negotiations or compromise with the people of Pakistan, that's uh, th that's that's a different question. And I think I'll reserve that for my wiser friends. But the military is definitely in a flux right now, for sure. Great, thank you. And we'll have some follow-up questions about the role of the military leadership. Again, thank you for making that distinction. It's very important. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, Moeed, if I may, uh, you know, I'm just going to shift gears a little bit. Um, how do you think this election will impact U.S.-Pakistan relations, right? So we know that successive U.S. administrations have relied on the Pakistani military to advance their st strategic interests, and they have actively worked to undermine civilian supremacy in that regard. Um, this time around here in the US, we've seen lots of international press writing about the elections in Pakistan, what this means for the Pakistani military. And um, there've been so many ongoing um, statements by congressional leaders, by um, senators who've issued tweets, who've issued statements, um, sort of decrying the, the electoral rigging that took place and also calling on the Biden administration to not recognize the results of the election until all the irregularities have been resolved. So do you think this is going to sort of have any impact on the way the State Department, the White House, is going to reevaluate its um, sort of relationship with the Pakistani military going forward? Malika, thank you so much. You know, before I come to it, just let me also dovetail with, um, uh, with the very um, uh, amazing description, academic and policy description, which Vijahat has given regarding the military. And I want to add a few points to it that um, militaries, however efficient, effective, brave, smart they might be, they're not designed as institutions to run countries, especially when countries are very large. Pakistan is the fifth largest nation state in the world. There's nothing in the CV of the Pakistani military that gives us the capacity to run such a complex federal framework, which has at least four uh, proper provinces with large populations. Pakistani province of Punjab is bigger than most of the states. Every state in the Europe is smaller than the Pakistani uh, province of Punjab with 120 million people living there. I think the largest states in Europe like Germany and Turkey are way smaller than the state of Punjab, right? And, you know, Pakistan province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is more than 50 million. Sindh is more than 50 million, you know, and uh, the Balochistan, the smallest province, is now more than uh, 12 million, which is still bigger than many states in Europe, right? So Pakistani military, like any military, uh, just imagine if United States military has to run United States. It is such a complex economic, political, and human society and system. So no military can run. Now, Pakistani military has the additional problem that they're running a country and they have an organization that is either trained to run a battle or a war. Uh, they have a chain of command. They have those stupid notions like chief is the army, army is the chief. I mean, the, the Jihad is very familiar with the army officers, you know, shamelessly, unabashedly uh, saying those things. So Pakistani military is now in serious trouble. 
militaries were looked upon by United States in the West as vehicles of control in the post-colonial uh, world after the Second World War. Militaries all over the world, Latin America, Far East, Middle East, uh, and in, in Pakistan, they were seen as agents of control by the West. And whenever they said that they're trying not to have instability, they meant actually they don't want people to become a leftist, to swing on the Marxist socialist side, or to people to have their own sovereignty. So militaries were used as tools to suppress the aspirations for sovereignty, which were always looking towards either Soviet Union or China. This is how the military's uh, role has been historically. And now Pakistani military in the Burma and you know some African countries are a few exceptions because by and large, the era of the running the states by the military is over. Now this is the background and I'm sure that many people would like to pick up uh, on this theme. Um, coming to your question, uh, there was some serious nexus between what uh, we can't really define it in exact black and white terms but whatever happened in Pakistan in April of 2022 in the form of the regime change operation had a serious nexus with Washington and London. Uh, and this didn't start in March or April 2022. It was going on throughout 2021. Uh, in hindsight, we can see it more clearly that it probably started you know, somewhere after President Biden uh, took hold on 20th of January 2021. Now, this is further reinforced when we look that in the past 22 plus months, everything that was ever sacred to the liberal democracy, uh, th things that have happened in Pakistan, the kind of repression that has been seen in Pakistan, the way the law, the constitution, the human rights, the political process, the media freedoms have all been violated, and the way both London and Washington and also European Union uh, kept mum on it, um, basically further supports the contention that they had something to do with the regime change operation. They were supporting it, you know, they were supporting it through World Bank, through Asian Development Bank, through IMF and everything. Now, Mahalika, to your questions, Mahalika, right? Mahalika is your name, right? If I correctly pronounce it. Uh, we had a, someone in the family, her name was Mahalika, so Mahalika. So Mahalika, the, uh, uh, what we have seen in the last couple of weeks, the last couple of days, basically, in the form of the reaction by the brain side of the Western uh, world, the cross-Atlantic world in the form of the New York Times and Washington Post and Touche Ville, Financial Times, BBC, Guardian, Intercept, and all taking a very clear Al Jazeera from Middle East. So the English-speaking press of the world taking a very clear position on the Pakistani, uh, Pakistani elections. This is a reaction coming from slightly left of the cross-Atlantic world thinking brain set. This is the uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the media basically, and then there is left of the center of the U.S. Congress, whether they're senators or members of the House of Representatives. This does not reflect the opinion uh, of the institutions that directly deal with Pakistan. Pakistan is dealt by Biden administration, the president's team, national security advisor is, is dealt by CIA and Bill and Bill Burns. Uh, is dealt by CENTCOM. These are the agents and the institutions and the State Department that deal with Pakistan. When people in Pakistan refer to America is against us, or America is doing this, I mean, this is such a misnomer. America is not a stereotype. Anyone who lives in the United States, and I mean, all of you who are living here know that this is a country, a dynamic country of 330 million people with several centers of power, authority, opinion making, and there are not even 50 people in Washington that deal directly with Pakistan. So, yes, the reporting uh, of the facts of the election that Imran Khan and Tariq and Saf, um, the man sitting in the jail, has all the moral authority and he has outmaneuvered the generals uh, through his popularity, uh, has been registered by the media, has been picked up by the Congress, also because the Pakistani American community is breathing onto their own constituency, uh, senators and the members of the House of Representatives. Uh, and it has put the Biden administration and the State Department on somewhat defensive, but I don't think that their um, internal thinking or the wiring has necessarily changed. For them to be on defensive, the Pakistani American community has to work hard through the media and through members of the Congress, because Congress is not necessarily part of the plan on the Pakistan. It's a large, two large institutions, the House and the Senate, uh, yes, uh, in the last one and a half years I've been here, I have interacted with the senators and House of Members representative and their teams. And I've noticed this thing, that those uh, congressmen and senators like, say, Greg Kassar of the Texas um, and many others, 
who are not necessarily connected with the intricate running of the foreign policy uh, by the Biden administration make more open, strong human rights positions. But I've also met those senators who have key positions with the administration, who are briefed by the intelligence and by the White House. They're very cautious and circumscript when they take their positions on, on Pakistan. You know, they understand that, uh, you know, the regime change operation is in our interest. So this is where the um, the actual ground reality is. And I would respond to be happily to questions uh, by the people, by the viewers. Yes, I'm sure they will have a lot of questions, especially about what current U.S. interests Pakistan is serving at this point. There was a point when, you know, we had heard that there were weapons being sent to Ukraine, um, small munitions being sent from Pakistan to Ukraine. And that was one of the big reasons that they had sort of moved away from Imran Khan and um, his independent foreign policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So but we will, I'm sure, come back to that. Um, I am going to go back to Pakistan now and ask Gibran. Um, Gibran, you've been working so hard, working the courts trying to respond to all of the grievances that certain political candidates have around the election fraud that's been taking place. But I'd also like to ask you something slightly different. You know, given the extreme challenges that Pakistan is facing right now, with skyrocketing inflation, unemployment, um, etc., so much suffering going on, how should the PTI and other parties conduct themselves in the post-election scenario? I mean, there is this whole sense of I mean, how do you balance the fight for justice regarding claims of election fraud with meeting the real basic human needs of the people of Pakistan and get on to the um, question of governing. So how do you how would you balance that? Does justice take precedence over everything else at this point? What is your opinion? I think we can all start by being honest to ourselves and being true in our ideals and not have uh, fixations about uh, individuals. I think the trouble with military does not start with the current leadership. I think this problem was there when Mr. Bajwa was there, when Mr. Rahil Sharif was there, Mr. Kiani was there. I do not know if the view of the panelists here or of the PTI supporters or of the PTI leadership was the same at that time, or all of us for that matter. I believe that our views of what is democracy and what is democratic changes with our party alignment as well. And I believe that the problem was there when we were talking about a hybrid system and a one-page policy under Imran Khan. And when uh, Mr. Imran Khan used to justify uh, the involvement and the intervention of military in very important institutions. And when key new institutions and development authorities were being set up and important posts were being given to serving military generals, then the question becomes that if tomorrow, after the current leadership completes a tenure and a new uh, uh, leadership comes in, and they make certain offers from Imran Khan and that are to his liking. Uh, are we going to see a repeat of that? I believe Nawaz Sharif did a lot of disservice to his voters by after having received the kind of response uh, his daughter did in uh, 2020 to then again have gone back on his word and that whole narrative of vote ko is though. So I believe our political parties do this great disservice to them. And it is very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, not an astute policy that all of them at different times are willing to speak to these power brokers, uh, but are not willing to speak to each other. I believe that currently the fact that there is no dialogue between the new league and the PTI is a bigger tragedy for Pakistan than the fact that whether a dialogue begins within the with, between the military leadership and Imran Khan or not. So the fact that uh, our civilian forces, our democratic forces have not been able to have that trust building, rather are happily uh, uh, happy to see themselves being used or the other being exploited uh, as long as they get to be in power. Uh, I think that does a lot big disservice. And now when uh, we have seen PTI having facing this criticism or this observation that Imran Khan needs electables, hence he needs certain kind of people in his party. That was the discussion in 2013. And then that was a discussion in 2018. But now on 8th Feb, when so many new people and no, so many new faces were given party tickets and even the party symbol was taken away with them. And it was a task for every constituency voter to find out and to not only make themselves aware, but everybody else aware of what the symbol is. And they still came out in droves and, uh, you know, voted for PTI. Now, the big test for Imran Khan is whether to believe in this power of the people and rely on this power or whether in the years, years to come, we will also see a change in narrative and a shift in narrative. I think that's where the problem is because we have to, of course, look at things in the long term, not the short term thing. This problem has been there since many decades. And uh, uh, for example, uh, 
the way the whole Panama case was uh, handled. I believe the disqualification of Ashwini's uh, uh, face in the Panama case was not merited. I do not think the case was decided in the in the manner the case was supposed to be decided. I don't think that uh, the the punishment he was given in that case and disqualified from holding a PM office was the right decision to make. And now we saw that entire process and those entire convictions being overturned and then him uh, being allowed to come in uh, and hold uh, the keys to the office if he so pleases. And at least arrangements were being made for that. And in that process, who got discredited? Our judiciary got discredited. Another civilian institution got discredited. having uh, Because at a certain time, the, uh, that leadership of the judiciary aligned itself with the establishment in a certain way. And then again, another leadership of the judiciary aligned itself in a different way with the current establishment. And because of this continuous um, shift in moods and ad hocism, which civilian institutions put themselves through, through uh, short-term self-serving goals, we do the entire polity a big disservice. Uh, my argument or my interest currently is not specific to PTI. I'm not fixated on Mr. Imran Khan. I'm fixated on democracy. I'm fixated on the rule by the people and for the people. It does not matter to me that the person whose case I'm fighting for is from Jamaat Islami or is from PTI or is from MQM. If the people has voted for him, if he or she is the winner, the real winner, I will be happy to take the case and uh, you know uh, to take the fight forward. And that is the kind of beliefs and um, ideals we need to populate amongst people. Uh, tyranny did not start after 9th May. Political tyranny and suppression has been there throughout the decades. Democracy did not start after Imran Khan took oath on 2018. We have had democratic tenors before as well, and we've had democratic struggles before as well. So we need to have a more holistic overview of our history and be true to ourselves. And I believe if this is supposed to be a watershed moment or if 88th Feb and the how the people have come out in droves and voted, despite what all odds are created, as you mentioned earlier, and if it's supposed to be a watershed moment, then I believe all of us need to be honest and say that, yes, because of whether confused narratives or whatever information was being told to us or how we grew up in a country which was run in a hybrid way, we were suffering from certain confusions, but now all of us are ridding of that, uh, ourselves of that confusion. And now we have clarity when it comes to civilian rule and uh, civilian supremacy. I think that is what is eventually going to take Pakistan forward, as opposed to this continuous tug of war, which we uh, fixate ourselves with and individuals we fixate, we fixate upon ourselves. I mean, uh, what is to say that, you know, Mr. Khan does not change his view tomorrow. He is the one who said that great leaders, a mark, taking a U-10 is mark of a great leader. Now, that is not only to say, uh, make a point right now, but the point is that the leaders also now to have to start believe in people. And I think the people have responded to the call of Mr. Khan. It is to his credit that for the past six months, he's been incarcerated. He's not seemed to have taken any deal. He's not seemed to have booked himself a ticket and gone to London. And he is, uh, you know, uh, take, uh, holding by his uh, stance and he is making his decisions and he is uh, uh, not trying to compromise on any of the uh, the views he has taken. And, and we believe and we hope that it's going to be that way. And I believe it is because of that, that those people who are propped up to challenge him, having realized what kind of impact it has amongst the people when a leader takes a stance, uh, those leaders are now leaving politics. Zangir Tareen, who was looking perhaps to have a very important portfolio in Punjab or in the center, has now resigned from politics. Pervez Khatak, who was making very big statements about wiping off PT PTI from uh, KP, hopefully, I don't know, with the help of the establishment not or not, has also resigned from his party, which he just recently formed. So they have realized how people respond to a leader when a leader has that clarity or at least claims to have that clarity. But uh, the, the task is and the test for the people, for the polity, for the media and for our political leaders is, is having that uh, uh, this as a uh, constant and only ro roadmap going the way forward and not to again uh, indulge in any shortcuts or any other uh, politicking or political engineering as long as it suppresses their opponents and gives them uh, a better uh, outcome. Thank you so much, Gibran, and thank you for your moral clarity in all of this as well, in which you sort of emphasizing the importance of principles over people and principles over parties. So that's really, really important. Thank you so much. And that leads me um, to my next question, which is for Vajahat. Um, and it's very much in line with what um, Gibran just said, Vajahat. You know, over the past two years, due to Imran Khan's falling out with the military establishment, there's been a huge shift in public opinion regarding the Pakistani military, right? Um, it seems as if the public has suddenly 
all of a sudden a sort of awaken to the military's role in human rights abuses, in enforced disappearances, in, you know, targeting nationalists across the country. It's as if now suddenly people are aware that these things have been happening. All of that, of course, was also reinforced after May 9th, um, you know, because of the way the military cracked down on pro-democracy activists and those notions were further reinforced. Now, do you believe... Um, as well, Gibran was sort of uh, referring to, do you believe this forecloses the possibility of Imran Khan ever striking a deal with the military um, and having you know, any role in a future political dispensation that is brought by the support of the military? Um, do you think his supporters will allow this? And is there a way forward without having to negotiate with the military? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so there's two questions. There's one about the people of Pakistan realizing uh, WTF, you know, what, what just happened with these guys? You know, what can they do? What are they capable of? That's one question. I think the second question is, will Imran kind of deal with them and how his people will, will take that? So I'll take it one by one. First of all, um, I think it's quite um, um, uh, unfair to say that the people of Pakistan have just uh, uh, finally um, uh, realized what uh, uh, these guys are capable of. Um, I come from two very interesting regions. Uh, I grew up in Karachi and I was born in Balochistan. Um, both those regions have had a very, very different um, perspective than uh, mainland Punjab, which is where all of this seems to be centered right now and happening um, regarding the military. Ask any random uh, uh, youngster in Pakistan demographic. Demographically, the country is around 25 years old right now, just so you know. On average, the average Pakistani is around in his mid twenties or her mid twenties. Um, ask, uh, walk around the streets of Quetta, um, and ask them what they think of the military, and uh, you're probably going to get a frown. Uh, same goes for Karachi for very different reasons. Um, Karachi has had an there's been an ethnic problem in Karachi, but there's also been um, impartial a partiality versus an impartiality problem. The people of Karachi have for years felt disenfranchised um, and commercially. Um, they don't get as much of a bang for their buck when it comes to um, their contribution towards the center, towards revenues, etc. Uh, meanwhile, the typical Quetta wall, as we call people from Quetta, uh, has another problem, probably an ethnic problem, probably a development problem. Um, there's raging Pashtun and uh, Baloch anger, which are the two ethnicities which dominate that city. Um, so I think it's a little rich for us to uh, say that Pakistanis didn't uh, um, uh, have problems with the military till recently. Pakistanis, some Pakistanis like yours truly, have had long drawn problems with the military for region for years, for decades. I, I should have focused um, on the Punjab. I think. Yeah, yeah. However, however, uh, the, the 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 party has now come to uh, the the home, the political, the political, cultural. Um, heartland of Pakistani politics and the, the seat of the Pakistani establishment, the Punjab. And now the Punjab is burning. And there's an old saying in Pakistani politics that when Lahore starts burning, things start happening, you know? And there's, an old, there's another great saying about Lahore that which has completely different implications. Um, but um, I'm not taking anything away from Lahore, but the Lahoris or the Punjabis rather from central and northern Punjab, by the way, I'm not even including southern Punjab, which has its own problems with the army, which is a whole other story. So we can't even broad brush Punjab here um, because there are divisions within that region as well. However, the seat of the political establishment and the seat of the army are now both stirred, perhaps even shaken, and they can't figure out who Bond is. Right. And there's one guy who knows, you know, and is acting like Bond. You know, he's in charge. And that brings us back to Khan. Now, Khan, as Gibran has pointed out, um, has uh, made a statement. He's made a stand. And uh, before he did, before uh, all of this happened, Khan was as perhaps um, fallible and as questionable as any other leader before him. His performance was as good or as bad as a governor, as the, as the prime minister of Pakistan, the 22nd, as anyone before him. There was nothing extraordinary about Khan 
as a governor, as an administrator, or as a prime minister at all. In fact, Khan was playing ball the same way regarding uh, civil liberties, uh, treatment of journalists. There was nothing exciting. Sure, he had some policies which were interesting, like he was very he was a big environmentalist. That was refreshing to see. But he was the, the same gaffes about women, the same gaffes about Osama bin Laden, the same gaffes about the Taliban. He was as good or bad as, or as ugly as everybody else. However, after he was removed, Khan has broken a pattern. Khan has stirred the country in a way which it was waiting to be stirred in. And then he's gone on and shaken the system. And that's his political martini, right? That's what his real contribution is. Khan has done more out of power than he did in the 25 years in his quest for power or his three years in power. That's Khan's greatest contribution. Khan has emerged as an anti-establishment figure. Now, people go on and blow holes in him that, oh, uh, he was uh, supported in the 2018 election uh, by the military, and yeah, they gave him 15, 20 seats, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, everybody, since you know Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who served, who was the Imran Khan of his time, by the way, he was the great populist leader of his time, he served as a as a as a as a foreign minister in in a military regime in the fifties. This goes all the way back. Who hasn't been greenlit, or who hasn't been nurtured in one way or the other, including Benazir, by the way, including the best of them and the worst of them? So it's unfair to just castigate Khan as the Brutus in this you know uh, in this murder of Caesar, you know this dictator who's taken on by this favorite son of his or this favorite foster son of his. He's no Brutus. Um, however, um, to your question, particularly, how will the, his followers take it? I think Khan knows his followers pretty damn well. And he's gotten this far uh, into effectively what he's claiming is a two-thirds majority, which is quite a claim. And some people, I think it's it's a pretty serious claim and should be taken seriously, by the way. Um, I think he got here this far on his own on taking exactly this 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 very rare stand as Gibran pointed out and he hasn't taken the deal he hasn't followed the formula which everybody else has there's a formula to this i think dr saab will, will has 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 done so many interesting shows on it but there's a formula to this you go away for 3 or 4 years you usually go to the middle east sometimes you go to england uh, back in the day, they used to go, go to America. But you basically just disappear for a few months or years, and then you return. It's almost like uh, the way they run the Pakistan cricket team. When a cricketer starts uh, underperforming, they send him off, and then this, the, 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 the media starts making noise about how they're really important, and they bring them back. That's exactly how they've been running Pakistani politics. The PPP has taken deals. The PMLN has have taken deals. There's a lot of leaders in the in the smaller parties. Uh, for example, a lot of current MQM leaders um, in the current dispensation in Karachi, they have taken deals. There's a lot of Baloch Sardars who have taken deals. But and they usually Imran, Yeah, but do you think Imran and, Khan is going to do that? I don't think so. And I think Imran is uh he's not doing this. Um I listen, I don't know what's driving Imran. But I do know that Imran is is in touch and has a very good read of the political mood of the country. I'm not his spokesperson. I'm not going to say, oh, he's uh, driven by God. He's a born again Muslim. His wife is his greatest peer and mentor. There's a lot of theories and conspiracy theories out there. I'm not here to explain Imran Khan's personal passions. However, I can explain his politics. And more than any other contemporary political leader, Imran really has his hand on the pulse of the people. There is something brewing in Pakistan, which is an anti-establishment, anti-military, anti-status quo, anti-system sentiment. Imran has tapped on it. He's tapped on it successfully. Now, whether the other people appreciate that and let them, you know, uh, have their way, let democracy have its course, or they come up with something which is uh, more violent, more dangerous, and something which which suppresses and takes us back to the, the status quo, that is, I think, now that's the way forward. That's the next big debate which people in Pakistan are starting to have. Things are starting to give. How will the system respond? That's Great. a big question.
Thank you. Thank you for that, which I had. Um, uh, uh, Amuid, I would like to ask you a question that's more about, you know, the role of the Pakistani diaspora. That's the last question before we head over to our audience. But if you would like to briefly maybe respond to Vajahat's comments on this and also Gibran's before you, uh, before I ask you the question about um, the role of the Pakistani diaspora. I was thinking Thank of, uh, Mahalka, I think Gibran has raised all the right questions. Uh, these are um, these are the questions that actually should be discussed. However, we need, I think, several hours, and I perhaps need English, French, Urdu, Punjabi, in many languages, vocabulary to be able to uh, to address those questions. Uh, from where it starts from, you know, uh, the penetration of the military, uh, I would say that um, unless we basically come to the structure of the Pakistani society and the politics, Pakistani politics and Pakistani state has by and large been, is a creation of the Pakistani military. The way the state grew from 1950s onwards, I mean, as early as 1955, the Pakistani military started rewiring the state structure, which the British had left. And now every politician, whether it's the poor Nawaz Sharif, or it's Asif Ali Zardari, or it's Imran Khan, or it's Benazir Bhutto, whosoever comes in, they have to operate inside an architecture that has been created by the military. And this is not only the administrative and the political architecture, it is also the structure of the thought. Many people talk of the, like Dr. Asha Sadiqa's books, talk of the military's financial corruption or the DHAs or the contracts they take and whatever they're doing. I think the bigger problem is the domination of the Pakistani thought, especially in Punjab and KP by the essence of the Sipa Salar, the existential conflict, the India, a national security. So the Pakistani state has grown under the concepts of a fear of India. Now, when we reflect back on the past 75 years, we can probably see that India has not or has not been able to harm the Pakistani state anywhere close to where the Pakistani establishment itself has harmed the Pakistani state through its failure of policies, lack of imagination, creating the narrative, the syllabus, you know, this Muhammad bin Qasim syllabus, this Islam syllabus, this sectarian conflict, this, this fear of thing, the sandwich between the states. So the Pakistani state has never, ever experienced a healthy politics. I'm not very hopeful that even this present moment, unless people like you, Jibran, me, Vajahat, and hundreds of other Pakistani students, doctoral candidates, the PhD candidate, the people who are studying political science, the reporters, the journalists, the editors, the civil society people are able to grapple up with the issues. What we actually need is a sustained dialogue with India to able to be able to overcome with the fear of this India, which the generals have cashed. The present crisis in Pakistan is not purely a civil military crisis, as he, as Bajahat says, the cabal of the generals. There is a serious organizational defects and problems within the structure of the military. What General Bajwa did and what his followers are now implementing was not necessarily the will of the Pakistani military rank and file. For instance, Imran Khan was a very popular leader in the military when he was removed in a regime change operation. Apart from General Bajwa and the others, he still, I mean, there are some figures about the, how the military officers have voted out of the 600,000 that they're floating on WhatsApp. I don't know whether the figures are true or not. But any one of us, we all come from military families. We have friends, cousins, brothers, sisters, you know, people in the military. We know that Imran Khan and PTI are very popular inside the rank and file of the military officers. So that doesn't change any equation. So this is not purely a civil military uh, conflict. It's a conflict. What is happening in Pakistan is an, uh, is an elite conflict versus the middle classes in many ways. And the great bulk of the Pakistani military, the captains, the majors, and the colonels. The largest single denomination are the majors and colonels. You know, The very few officers rise above the rank of the brigadiers, right? So they are all in the middle class. I mean, the middle class people definition is they have one wife, they have two or three children. They generally have one major car like Toyota, and then they have a smaller car like Suzuki in the home. And when they retire, they have generally one home. Now, of course, the military has become very privileged and corrupt, and they have more than one home. But the real problem starts from the military's organizational structure and the ideas that military can govern Pakistan better than the politicians, that military can bring in, bring a momentarily sort of discipline 
uh, onto the society, our time management, some very basic crude concepts of management, which every American organization is better in doing than the Pakistani military. Some basic time management that people have to turn up in the office at, say, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. You know, streets have to be clean. People right. have to be turned up in, you know, in, in with a tie or with a shirt or a suit. These are the essential management models that the Pakistani military has. So uh, unless the mental under poverty of the Pakistani middle classes and intelligence here, in which we had accepted that General Raheel Sharif was a great thinker or something, in which we thought that every general was somehow the more intelligent. What is there in the background of an army general that makes him more distinguished than a civil servant? The Pakistani diplomats, these federal secretaries, these commissioners are more educated, more intelligent, more broadly you know, trained in, uh, and understand the world than Pakistan army officers. But the concepts of Pakistani media and all of us have been giving, the military officers have some special capability. And, and before the last 30 months or 20 months or 22 months, we were also made to believe that as compared to the civil servants and police officers and the politician, the military officers are perhaps more honest, they have great integrity, they love the nation. So all those things have been jolted. I guess Jahat has given a lot of credit to Imran and almost everybody wants to like to give a lot of credit to Imran. Anyone who watches my vlogs, I think the credit goes to the demographic change. The credit goes to the rise of social media. The credit goes to a technologically interdependent world in which these platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, Twitter have brought the people together. Sure. And if a, if a larger percentage of the Pakistani population was more well-versed with English, I think the like the way they are in India, I think this revolution would have been even more, more stronger. So, yes, unless we correct the ideas, Imran Khan will have no option but to deal with the military. Deals do happen. Deal has a very bad word. But Nawaz Sharif was compelled to deal with the military. Look what has happened to Nawaz Sharif. There was a Nawaz Sharif that comes up. There, are, there was a Nawaz Sharif that tries to challenge the general's domination in the 90s, was beaten back. Everybody, and then he, of course, did his mistakes. But when he was thrown out by Musharraf, all shades of public opinion, all political parties, all media, all newspapers, what was there, welcomed General Musharraf's military intervention. And he was a very popular coup maker. So there was no intellectual consideration of the fact because the way the structure has been created and wired, even when a civilian prime minister wants to deliver, he becomes a sort of a dictator. So the ideas that have to be cultivated is how do you really stop the authoritarianism and the dictatorship? For instance, Bangladesh is not a military dictatorship. Now, a huge problem with the Pakistani intelligentsia is this. For the past 10, 15 years, in order to shame the military, they have been saying, look, the kind of progress that Bangladesh has done without understanding the internal political dynamics of Bangladesh, where India has put its weight behind Bangladesh. It is a dictatorship. It's a very, very sick dictatorship what is, happening, what is happening in Bangladesh. It's not a military-run dictatorship. Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship. Qatar is a dictatorship. UAE is a dictatorship. Oman is a dictatorship. Syria is a dictatorship. These are not military-run dictatorships. The ideas that have to develop is that how do you promote democracy, what Gibran says, but the military is not the only obstacle. In, you know, so if the military is defeated, first of all, what will the military do is they will replace the bad faces. They're very specialist in it. They'll get rid of their generals. They will beat back a retreat for 24 months. I mean, the military was roundly, what could be a bigger defeat than the fall of Dhaka in 1971? Within oh, five and a half years, the military comes back, you know, destroys all the democratic facade, hangs over one of the most popular politicians in the history of the country. So Imran Khan will not be any different. Anyone in the PTI who thinks that Imran Khan will reinvent the wheels of the history is not going to happen unless a few hundred thousand people, especially a few thousand Pakistani intellectuals and intelligentsia between North America, Europe, UK, Lahore, Islamabad, Karachi, come to some basic ideas where we need democracy. I mean, in this country, educated people have been saying, Malika, Islam is not compatible with democracy. We don't need democracy. Democracy is not. I mean, so first of all, we have to decide that we need democracy and what is democracy. And there is no Western style of democracy. Democracy is democracy, right? China is not a democracy. Russia is not a true democracy. Iran is not a true democracy. United States is a democracy. France is a democracy. UK is a democracy. And this is how we have to go and build a concept of democracy and stop saying this thing that, you know, hamara mizaj democracy ka nahi hai. Hame Western style democracy suit me karti or unless we defeat all that kind of stupid intellectual nonsensism Imran Khan or no Imran Khan we're not going to make any difference in our future
Thank you so much, Moeed. And you know, uh, you really brought it back to people, the people of Pakistan, right? If unless there is a groundswell movement of the people of Pakistan, maybe supported by the diaspora, um, nothing can do to really shift those dynamics. And I did have that last question, but I'm not going to ask it right now. It's mostly about the role of the Pakistani diaspora and what they can do. And maybe inshallah, at the end of the program, we can come to that and, um, you know, maybe end with that. So um, thank you all so much for this incredible analysis. I'm you gave us so much to think about. We also have a wonderful crowd of people who are, you know, uh, very eager to ask their questions. So we're now going to turn it over to the Q&A session. I'm going to turn it over to Shahar Yar, um, who is going to be fielding the questions. We're going to try and get to as many as possible. And with that, with that, Shahar Yar, over to you. And I just wanted to ask one thing, Gibran, um, I know you're super busy. Did you have to go very soon? Because we could direct the first few questions to you. If you're here for another half an hour, we could just... Um, you know, sort of proceed accordingly. I, I had to leave uh, a bit early, but uh, out of respect for all your listeners and participants, um, I'm fine staying a few minutes more so that I can at least take a few questions from them. That would be wonderful. We are so grateful. So Shahiyar, please direct them to Gibran first. Thank you. And I hope that's okay with the others. Thank you. And then we have, uh, we have quite a few questions. So I'm going to club a few. Uh, the first two questions, um, I think Gibran would be the perfect candidate for those. Uh, one of the questions, as as rightly Dr. Pizada mentioned about the change in dem demographics and the impact of that, the question is how PTI, as well as Gibran, can utilize data uh, and bring about a youth pol political approach uh, and focus on youth economic revolution. So that's one question for you, Gibran. And the second is, uh, how do you see the left movement's future in, in Pakistan's uh, politics as well as in Karachi's. Um, and, and the gentleman who asked is also worried about uh, why there's so little voice for minorities and for the underprivileged. Um, over to you. Um, I think how PTI can do it, uh, that question can be answered best by PTI and uh, how what future there is for the parties of the left. Some are representatives from the left parties, uh, I think would be better able to answer it. I'd like to simply make a point uh, referring to, you know, this new demo demographic uh, Saab was talking about, and also the point he mentioned that uh, some uh, people from the diaspora and some intellectuals and what is known as our inter intelligence or civil intelligence or academia, they need to get together. Um, I don't think that that may be the solution to our problem. I don't think that a few hundred or a few thousand people are going to change the country. Uh, because that also inherently uh, involves a sense of entitlement. And uh, that is also a way that, uh, you know, dictatorial uh, uh, behavior is shown uh, within civilians as well. That is also what is wrong with our political parties, that just because they feel that a civilian is holding the office of the prime minister, democracy has been established in Pakistan. The basic fundamentals of democracy is missing in Pakistan. And for that, we need structural changes. And once structural changes are there, I believe everybody out of the 240 million of this country will be able to participate in that. We do not have student unions. We haven't had student unions for uh, 40 years. I believe there's a lot of intellectual stagnation when it comes to our colleges and our universities. Who am I to sit and determine which uh, of this youth of this particular college or university has the potential to go to the maximum level? Uh, unless I provide them opportunities and avenues to participate in that and engage in democratic principles and values, uh, even with those who they uh, ideologically oppose on campuses. Uh, India, for example, has a very strong tradition of student politics, so much so that it is a holiday in Delhi when Delhi University campuses go for elections. Uh, we also do not have properly established functioning uh, workers and traders union, which provide a uh, collective bargaining power to the poor, to the oppressed, to the working class. And our current laws, uh, which regulate our unions, are extremely flawed. And they are made in a way to disenfranchise workers and trader unions. So, and I believe that they themselves can also produce amazing leadership, and they have. Uh, one of them, for example, if I talk about farmers, Meher Sattar, who is now contested from the PTI ticket, um, has done remarkable work. And he is not a conventional politic, uh, political figure or a, from, a representative of a mainstream political party. He, after having successfully led that movement, later joined the PTI. So we do not have avenues for that, that as well. And the third thing is, from which our political parties shy away because they believe that that would dilute uh, that centralization of a power model which political parties also crave, uh, like the military. And that is that they do not promote uh, local governments. 
uh, military dictatorships promote local governments to actually as an alternate to the existing political party structure to take the political parties away and their usage away and simply say that politics is all about administration it's not about law making it's not about policy making and local governments on its own without a political party presence is fine and political parties do not promote um, uh, local governments when they are in power because they feel that that uh, they will dilute the powers of their own mnas and mpa and uh, that patronage and those loyalties which they have uh, uh, developed over decades and the cause of which they exist in a pyramid kind of a structure especially the noon league and people's party and for most part pt has done that so now now will of course with a lot of new faces coming and i hope that will change because local governments are also going to open a lot of avenues for youth to engage in politics uh, to start you know uh, uh, to introduce a better service delivery model at the constituency level at the union council level and uh, and that is how democracy will eventually and the rule by the people will actually eventually start delivering to the people uh, for democracy to uh, to thrive uh, it is not that you just have to oppose any intervention from the military that democratic setup also has to work for the people it also has to give benefit for for the people the people also has to have a sense of ownership towards it and i believe these three things student unions workers and traders unions and local governments these three structural changes have to be there and then on top of that any input by our academia by our intelligentsia uh, be it our you know professionals or be it our corporate giants or be it members from the uh, diaspora whoever it is would be able to contribute better to it now uh, when you talk about the new demographic the youth of pakistan uh, i believe given how much we have in terms of more than 60% of pakistan being under 35 or under 40 right now we don't have enough avenues to allow them to participate in this democratic process and i believe that their potential is more than just making trends on social media or just you know creating artwork of those things i think they can actually participate in actual leadership and actual decision making process uh, and for that we need to have more uh, avenues of politics and leadership beyond our parliament beyond uh, those limited number of seats in the national assembly and the provincial assembly and um, uh, these structural changes will eventually uh, develop a huge force for democracy when hundreds and thousands of people will be uh, engaged uh, in, in a process uh, and would be actually uh, uh, talking about people's issue doing politics on people's issues delivering on people's issues uh, that i believe would serve pakistan better uh, rest i mean uh, data of course is there and data is being used smartly and data was used uh, uh, i believe uh, by by trump as well in his election campaign Uh, technology uh, technology works wonders uh, all it actually comes down to is what's your intent behind uh, using technology do you want to create multiple small echo chambers do you want to manipulate the minds and pollute the minds of the people do you want to uh, force and shift and paint a particular narrative which may not have anything to with the truth because right now uh, in this digital age in this uh, when we are dealing with people who are uh, for most part getting and receiving news through social media populism and fake news is also a big threat to our democracy that can also be used eventually to you know shut down this entire system and have a direct rule by the military so we also need to guard ourselves against that as well um, so there are challenges uh, as there are opportunities with technology coming in uh, but i believe uh, uh, somebody uh, from pti would be uh, better uh, suited to answer this question on how that party intends on using it Uh, currently right now i believe that uh, uh, the current system which the pti has uh, which they call the constituency management system that i think amongst all the parties in pakistan they have uh, by far the most access to uh, individual numbers when it comes to vote registered voters in a constituency and that is a system they have been working on since 2013 and um, through that they are able to reach to at least Uh, a far uh, majority uh, decent majority of a constituency with their political messaging and i think that is also what enabled them in these extraordinary circumstances to uh, engage voters at a constituency level and inform them of who the candidate was and what the political symbol was electoral symbol was for the election um, so they by far when it comes to social media when it comes to using data when it comes to using technology have uh, Uh, um, smarted uh, all the existing political giants in pakistan and there's a lot to learn but at the same time i believe in the past and even currently uh, pti has time and again done itself a lot of disservice as well by uh, populating or uh, propagating or advocating certain news 
which did not have any uh, re real footing in facts. Uh, and I believe they need to be cautious with that as well. Because uh, when you're out there uh, to, say, fight a, um, a ideal, uh, an honorable fight, a good fight, I don't know how you like to say this, this fight for civilian uh, supremacy, you don't need to go uh, and rely on propaganda. For example, this statement today made by the commissioner, Rawal Pindi, a lot of reliance is being placed on this. I do not think that he is or should be the star witness for PTI when it comes to electoral rigging. If a man in his position and in his office can call in the entire media and plan for a press conference, he could have at least shared some documentary evidence with the media as well. He could have at least shown some copies of Form 45s or Form 47s, which he helped manipulate. I mean, every single candidate of PTI has the capacity to do so. I was surprised that this gentleman did not have the capacity to do the same. And if tomorrow... He is not able to prove any evidence. And if tomorrow, for whatever reasons, for any deal or any compromise, this gentleman himself may uh, struck, is not able to uh, support his word, and the entire PTI bases his narrative on his testimony, then they're going to do themselves a lot big disservice. They have their own evidence. I believe they have their own star witnesses. And it's better for PTI to rely on those political opponents who are now rallying with the PTI, like the jamaat islami like the GDA, like the TLP and others, and rely on their testimony of what happened in the elections, as opposed to this, uh, this bureaucrat who's near his retirement, and who I had at least heard nothing about before uh, before I heard the press conference. And I have no reason uh, to, to go by his word and uh, make him the star witness of what happened in the 2024 elections. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Bajahat. You have yeah yeah no I uh, I uh, just wanted to add uh, one thing to that not really add to Gibran's uh, very important points but I think that we must um, address as an individual question so consider this my question to the whole panel um, along with the other questions um, we need to also um, considering that this is about the path forward we need to come very clean and clear about uh, whether any of us think that. Uh, Pakistan is currently poised for some sort of an emergency or a military takeover, considering the uh, chain of events and the momentum um, of chaos uh, that seems to be brewing. But I will let um, the other panelists weigh in before I come into this as well. But we should include this in one of the questions unless um, someone has asked this. Thank you, Vijayad. Actually, the, 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 fact, the, 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 the fact that, you know, Vijayad has brought it up and the fact that somebody like the Peer Shah Pagara uh, in his rally is hinting towards it very openly and clearly is sounding a lot of alarm bells. And that is why it is a bigger test for parties like the People's Party and the Nundi because their leadership currently is not incarcerated. Their leadership is currently free to meet and, uh, you know, discuss things amongst themselves. And they bear a far bigger burden than the incarcerated leadership of PTI right now to ensure that uh, things are not pushed to that level, that we have a complete breakdown and non-democratic forces have an excuse to set up. Not that they will need it, but uh, you know, not to make hmm. ground any for, more fertile for them. But that, you know what? Thank you so much. And I think the next question would would be would be directed to all three of you, but maybe Vajahat and Dr. Pizza that kind of point first. Uh, so this is this question is important. What if a significant portion of the Pakistani society believe that there is a small portion amongst them who send their children to different schools? They have their own separate hospitals. They live in separately uh, in, in in nicely curated cantonments. They have major assets and investments in different nations. Um, and if they're the stakeholders, then do we really consider them as Pakistanis? Uh, that's 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 a question that I can I can open to either Vajahat or Dr. Pisa the first. So up to you guys. Okay, can, can I can I take a leave? I'm getting a call. I've got uh, certain people waiting for me. If I find maybe I didn't want to abruptly leave, so if I can take your leave. Please, thank you so much, Gibran. Thank you for Bye. your incredible commentary. Thank Bye, you. buddy. You take care. Take care, Gibran. Thanks for very good questions. Stay take safe. care. And looking forward thank to you. staying in touch. Phone kar mujhe. Baad mein. <laughs> Badmash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. So, uh, yep. Going back to the question, that's something. I mean, then, then many of us growing up. I mean, when we do see that an average Pakistani has different amenities, but the others who actually are part of the elite have 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 certain amenities that they they do not get to share with others. Uh, how do people respond? 
Who wants to answer that? Vajahat, or are you asking me? Uh, no, I'm 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 not gonna uh, spoil this one for you, Doc. This is all you. All yours. <laughs> I think this is not a very good question. I mean, it looks it's a very simplified question. It's just like a very angry question. All uh, what the question refers to is a serious class conflict inside Pakistan, because of the years of the martial law. For instance, the general Ziaul Haq's martial law. The generals wanted to. They realized that their constituency is the military. And they wanted to please the military. And um, there is an excellent book by Khalid bin Sayyid, uh, who was a professor in Canada, in Ontario University or something, who had written The Nature and Direction of Political Change in Pakistan, in which the book, book was written somewhere in the early 1980s. And it basically uh, refers to how General Zia was taking steps to make the military his constituency and was trying to give them more privileges, more land, more access to different kind of financial or economic incentives. So the military of 1950s and 60s didn't have that kind of privileged life. I mean, they, yes, they had a privileged life with the British left, but the way the military has been deliberately turned into a holy cow and a very privileged institution with a lot of corruption that is being ignored, especially in the case of real estate and other things, is a function of the martial laws. Uh, if we can revert to a genuine democracy, which is not easy, I'm not very hopeful that we are necessarily going towards a democracy, we do not have a clarity about what democracy means. Um, uh, yes, Imran Khan has produced a huge revolution, but do Imran Khan himself realizes what democracy is, at least when he was in political power, he was not very clear on what democracy is. The way he had to bargain and leverage his own position with the uh, military, which was a necessity as well, when people say out of idealism for lack of understanding, there was no other possibility. It was not possible for Nawaz to stay away from bargaining with the military. It was never possible for Imran to stay away from bargaining with the military. The kind of vision that is needed to put Pakistan onto democracy uh, is not going to, well, Gibran has said excellent things, but um, uh, I'm a very keen student of political science. Uh, I will give you two examples which people do not understand. In 1789, there was a French Revolution phenomena. So people have only heard of the French Revolution. They have not followed up that within 10 years, the French Revolution failed and gave way to the worst dictatorship in the history of France in the form of Napoleon Bonaparte, who then went on conquering uh, not only the France, but, but the Europe, and they were fighting, fighting, fighting. For the next 100 years, the French Revolution could not reach a proper republic or a proper democracy. So much so in, in 1851, there was a popularly elected... Uh, a leader, the Napoleon III or something, who actually finished the democracy and declared himself as a king. So moving away from the ideas when you do not fully understand the ideas is not easy. There are no centers of understanding within Pakistan that how do you deal with the dictator, dictatorship. Ending or defeating the military is not necessarily the beginning of democracy, as the example of Bangladesh reveals very well. If you read the literature of the communist revolution in 1917, they didn't want to have a communist dictatorship. They also wanted to have all the ideas of human rights and everything, but everything failed within the next five to six years when Stalin settled up and became the worst dictatorship, uh, which was not a military dictatorship, which was a communist party dictatorship. And China has a very, very worse kind of dictatorship, as, ex as I've explained. So it is the problem is with the military, but this is a very cosmetic and optical definition. The problem is with the Pakistani people's understanding. Gibran doesn't like the word intelligentsia. Well, let's broaden it. Maybe hundreds and thousands of Pakistanis have to understand, but every young boy sitting in the village will not understand that thing. Yes, they have to be student unions, but Pakistan is in trouble unless a very large number of people, call them intelligentsia, call them diaspora, call the people in the universities, call them whatever you want to say, labor unions, whatever. Unless a very large number of people agree to this, that we have to have good relationship with India, we have to uh, we and we have to believe in democracy. And there is no other Islamic form of democracy. There is only one form of democracy. The French system is different from the American system. The French system is different from the uh, the Latin American democracy is different from the British system. But there is a basic sense of democracy through the adult franchise. And they have and America is an excellent democracy in the sense that every city has an elected something elected. Mayors are elected, school boards are elected, you know, there is a House of Representatives of 435 people that are directly elected, there is a Senate of 100 people that are directly elected, 
There is a president that is directly elected. There are governors that are directly elected. There are so many multiple centers of power. That is why I and Vajahat can say any kind of shit against Biden and he cannot do anything against us. Do you agree with Vajahat that, you know, people can say anything about, I mean, look at what happened, this young boy who said this thing that we don't have to respect the army generals. Why should we respect the army generals? I mean, this guy, Naeem Arif or something, you know, in Mandi Bahawadeen, and they've taken him away. And no Pakistani paper is raising that point. I mentioned that, and, and, and Adil of the Siasat.pk has raised that in a vlog. No, no human rights. You see, the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan is not raising that issue. Dawn newspaper is not raising that issue. Tribune is not raising that issue. So there's no sense of human rights and democracy in Pakistan. It's a very cop optical idea. Maybe Vajat can say a few nice things. I can say, Jibran can say a few nice things and leave. But Pakistanis do not believe in the concept of democracy. Many who are supporting Imran Khan, they just, they just think that Imran Khan will come. This is such a fragile idea. What if the military kills Imran Khan? Putin has just killed Alexei Navalny right the other day. I mean, they just killed him, right? I mean, do you think he just died of a natural death? I mean, Putin has killed so many people. So what if Imran Khan dies out of natural, natural, you know, causes? If they, what if there is a heart attack or a stroke or something like this? So the military poisons him. So what will happen to the old PTI movement? There has to be a concept of democracy unless very large number of people are wedded and believe in the concept of democracy. Pakistan is not going to move towards a better future. Thank you. Um, so there's another question from Saud Anwar, um, and M, you can decide who we who we can ask. Uh, is the writer, the writer Saud Anwar? Is no, Saud Anwar? this is a state senator from Connecticut. Okay. Yes. Um, is one of the issues with the current situation in Pakistan that Pakistan is a battleground between control and interest of United States and China? Yeah, so I'm going to dodge that one. And there's a great question in the q and I'll come back to the United States and China question, but I really uh, want to stick to the theme of this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this panel, which is the way forward. I don't really want to get into geopolitics uh, right now. So let's just uh, uh, leave maybe China for a minute. Dr. Pizadha can answer that. But yes, go ahead, Vijahad. Yeah, no, um, we can all uh, weigh in on the geopolitics in just a bit. But I agree uh, with Vajahat. It's, it's, it is unnecessary to go in such detail. Yes, it is true. The answer is simple. Yes, Pakistan is a battle down between China and US. But what more to <laughs> talk about? Right. Um, but premised on that, there was a great question. Uh, Abhi Abhi Ayatha. It was about the army. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, in the sense that it was a very existential question that uh, how do we fix the army? Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, because this keeps on. We keep on circling back to the military in, in all of this as a major player. Now, that's a difficult question. Um, and so it must be tackled. Um, so the army armies usually go away uh, either through revolutions or total wars where they are decimated. I think Dr. Muit Pirsada has done a pretty good job <laughs> Uh, being the skeptic about revolutions. Um, revolutions, yes, destroy armies. They also give birth to dictators. They create so, new armies. Yeah, yeah, and and probably worse ones. So let's uh, let's let's just. Uh, I mean, even in our neighborhood, we don't have to go to France. Even in our neighborhood, let's just look at Iran. Post revolution, Iran has a pretty scary army and a pretty scary dictatorship, right? By several standards. So let's not let's not romanticize the concept of revolution yet. I know a lot of PTI, my friends in the PTI, romanticize it. It's a very bad idea, uh, considering. Um, it's also not very realistic because, in a lot of senses, the Pakistan army is uh, is uh, uh, too big to fail uh, for global standards. Um, revolution will not be encouraged in a place like Pakistan. There's 200 nuclear weapons. Um, there's uh, nine corps, uh, at least 30, 35 divisions. This is the world's fifth largest army. No, this is not uh, a little banana republic, though it's acting like a banana republic. It is not a little banana republic in, in, the, in Central Africa or South America. Uh, they're acting like they're a banana republic in Central Africa or South America, but they're not. <laughs> and, and that's something which will not be encouraged, um, uh, globally speaking, either. Which takes us to war which is the other way armies uh, 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 finish. And I hope to God that uh, with the uh, nuclear uh, umbrella hanging over South Asia, which has two of the fastest growing nuclear programs in the world, India and Pakistan. So Pakistan is the most 
uh, uh, highest proliferating nuclear program in the world, the fastest number of nuclear warheads per year out of all the nuclear club countries are added by the Pakistani military. So this is a very, very bad uh, 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 assessment to make. Okay, or revolution or jung, it's silly. Which takes us to the third and least talked about bit, uh, which is reforms. And I think there's a high time we start discussing realistic military reforms, right? Now, what are realistic military reforms? Is it a realistic military reform to say, ha, Imran Khan, Aiga, and then everybody will, uh, uh, Imran Khan will just uh, fire Asim Munir, and then Imran Khan will fire uh, all the core commanders, and then everything will be fine? No. Okay, even if he does that, which he probably won't, but even if he does that, uh, there's a whole uh, chain of command which is going to replace them. That's just how they work. So, no, that's not going to happen. Um, we need to, however, look at the region and at examples and at parallels of very powerful militaries which have been reformed with their civilian counterparts uh, in understanding and in tow. The closest example in our region of recent times is Indonesia, right? Indonesia had a pretty serious dictatorship through the 60s into the mid 90s, into the late 90s. 30 plus years. Uh, Right. And it was one of, it was a pretty bloody, awful dictatorship. If, by, by global standards, it was, a, it was a horrible dictatorship. And here's what happened. The Indonesian military realized in the late uh, 19, uh, uh, 90s that it didn't want to miss the Asian tiger bus, right? Which South Korea, um, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, South, and all these other countries were getting on. Indonesia was uh, also excited about the prospect of becoming an Asian, an Asian tiger, which is something, by the way, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, the wannabe prime minister, is very fond of. He still thinks that there's an Asian tiger movement, even though that the Asian tiger movement is almost 30 years old now, but he's, he's still stuck in the 90s. But that's a, that would be a digression, right? Anyways, what the Indonesian military did was they saw this boom happening in the region, and they were the least responsive because they were the most clunky uh, out of control dictatorship. So they said, listen, we will start ceding power to the civilians. And they called in, they got rid of the dictator and they called in the right civilians. And they said, okay, we want to do this right. We don't want to lose this opportunity, but we're not going to give you total control because you know we're the big bad Indonesian military. We're going to do this really slowly, but you can start to weigh in. So what do you want? Tell us, tell us what you want. And maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't do it. No promises, but you'd better deliver. You'd better deliver this Asian tiger pizza, which we want as well. We want a, we want a, pie, we want a piece of this pie. And that's where you start seeing through at least a decade and a half, you start seeing very, very slow reforms in Indonesia. But the military had to take the first step and see where they were wrong, where they were clunky, where they were uh, old fashioned and where they needed civilian partners to do the right things, to get on the Asia Tiger bus and not miss that economic opportunity, which they availed. It was very slow, very painful. Several prime ministers came after that, they were fired. But the one thing, for example, which is important to recall is the one thing the civilians started doing was directly not just hiring the chief of army staff, which is what happens here. Pakistan is the only weird place in the world now left in the modern political e economic system where the head of government hires someone who's more powerful than him to replace him. It's not done anywhere else in the world. It was being done in Indonesia too. But what they started doing, the civilians was like, okay, we're not just going to hire the, the military boss. We're going to hire the entire military brass. So the whole lineup of the army and the armed forces, a bunch of generals, around maybe two to three dozen generals, were all picked up by the military. And that diluted the individual egocentric problem, which Pakistan is seeing right now. Bajwa didn't like Imran, so Bajwa got rid of Imran. Imran liked Faz, so Faz made sure Imran likes him, and he started, he had his own power play. These conspiracy dramas go away when you have a more democratically elected, 
a more qualified military brass. That was the first thing they did. They obviously did yeah. a bunch of other things, and I don't want to get into those details, but it's very clear that the missing conversation at a moment like this, when um, leading uh, a political uh, elite are beginning to uh, ponder over whether there is going to be a military takeover, some sort of an emergency measure, we really need to now have start having this conversation openly because we've had every other conversation openly. Right. Why can't we have the military reform conversation openly right. uh, about what's the next way to fix this? Because ultimately, they are our military. I have I am very proud of the work the military does on a day to day tactical level. They give yeah, a lot of sacrifices. The these boys, absolutely right. So, but they need to be reformed because they're badly led. These are some very brave young men and women, but they're very yeah. badly led. So and I how think do that we will be. I think the reform of the military is going to be our next conversation. So we'd love to have you back for that. Um, and but we do have so many questions, guys, and we do want to get to other ones as well. There and is. I have to leave as well. You have to leave and and you have to leave. Like we have, would you guys be able to stay for another five minutes? Yeah, yeah, ten minutes. But then we should actually. Absolutely, yeah, yes, absolutely. Also. And we really appreciate that. Um, Shaya, there's a question by um Runcha Mubashir. Do you want to um? Can, can you see it or should I read it? I can. I can see it. Uh, okay, it's, excellent. It's actually, a question that that would be about going forward. What is the one fundamental thing that civil society members can take actionable steps on to move the needle in the correct direction? I think Bajahat has already um, said this thing. I think the single most important thing is that people should start debating that how the military can be reformed. When we talk of the judicial reform, political reform, police reform, everyone accepts that we are sincere, meaning that we want reform. I mean, like student body reform, faculty reform, university reform. But the moment someone, a civilian says the military has to be reformed, the way Bajahat has said it, Immediately, you know, there is a threat perception that these are sensitive matters, you shouldn't really talk about it. But the time has arrived that hundreds and thousands of people all across the world, Pakistanis, have to debate that military needs reform and what kind of reforms the military structure needs. For instance, the army, for instance, I mean, a few things I can say bullet points very quickly, but this is a big subject. The Pakistan army chief has a, a I mean, there's no other office in the world that has the kind of uh, power uh, and prestige and control on an organization the Pakistan Army Chief has. Uh, it it has it has happened because of the martial laws. The real uh, the real senior most officer is Chairman Joint Chief of Staff, who has been turned into a total ceremonial position. He has no authority after the 1980s martial law. So there should be the the powers and position of the Pakistan Army Chief has to be diluted. There has to be a, say a board of senior generals, say 10, 15, 20 which have an sort of one first among the equals as a coordinator. But the, but the way the Pakistan army chief exists, this kind of office is a problem for the army, is a problem for Pakistan, is a threat to the democracy. Um, there is no, there's no point for the inter-services intelligence to have either the political wing or the ISI to be reporting to the army chief. Why the Pakistan's premier intelligence agency, which has all the resources, reports directly to the army chief? The chief of the ISI, the DG ISI, should be a civilian. He should be in all. He should preferably be a diplomat. I mean, the head of the CIA right now is a uh, is a lifelong diplomat. Will William William Burns? Bill Burns is a diplomat, right? He has served State Department for thirty plus years. So it can be a DNG officer. It can be a police officer. It can be um, it can or it can be a retired officer. But whosoever heads the ISI should not be reporting to the army chief, should actually be reporting to Senate Intelligence Committee and the Prime Minister, and should be accountable to the Pakistani courts, high courts and Supreme Court. Similarly, the 12 DGs, which are work under the, and are all uniformed officers under the ISI, should all be civilian police officers or DMG officers or diplomats. They should have nothing to do with the army. Anyone that is on comes on secondment from the army should retire from the army, should have no active link with the army, the way many officers are recruited into police and district management, and that they are not reporting to the army, but they're reporting to the chief secretary or they're reporting to the IGP. So they should have no connection with the army. So this militarization of the Pakistani political structure and the administrative structure is one idea towards the reform. I would also suggest that within the PMA and the staff college, the constitution and the constitutional responsibilities of the Pakistani officers should be there. That Pakistan, it should be taught to the young officers at age 18 and 20, that Pakistan is mandated to be a democracy. 
will have a directly elected parliament. There are political reforms and military has nothing to do. It should be part of their examination curriculum at the level of the PMA, at the level of the staff college. We also need to declare that all the usurpers, we even if they have died, Ayub and Yahya and Yerotika and whatever and General Musharraf, we should actually ceremonially declare themselves as criminals under Article 6, that they had usurped power, they had destroyed Pakistan. We should stop eulogizing them and giving them the kind of importance we have been giving. We need to declare them as dark characters uh, rather than as the positive characters from the Pakistani history. Maybe in the school textbook boards, we should actually introduce them as the rogue characters who had hurt the Pakistan. These are some of the uh, elements, the time is less. If someone asks the question, I can respond. But the single most important thing the Pakistani intelligentsia needs to be discussing is that what are the ways and means we can, this is our military. We have spent hundreds of billions of dollars in creating this military structure. These young officers, mothers, I mean, the mother of Shaheed uh, Aziz Bhatti or Major Tofail or Lalik Jan were not produced by GHQ. They were not commissioned by GHQ to produce the Shaheeds and the Martyrs and Nishani Heathers. I mean, how have they just colonized all the people of Pakistan into some sort of society to serve the military? I mean, these I mean, unless we unless we challenge these ideas as the ideas level, Imran Khan and 100 Imran Khans are not going to make any difference. And you're absolutely right, Muid. And I feel like the first element that we need in all of this is courage. Um, the Pakistani people have shown a lot of courage in the previous months in the way they've come out and the way they have sort of stood up against the military. The other thing is socialization, right? And you sort of touched on that. And there was a question about that as well, about the syllabus being rigged. The the, the socialization of our next generations is with, a, with syllabi that are sort of, you know, proclaiming these military leaders as heroes, as the guardians, as our saviors. So I think that also has to play a very important role. Um, I, uh, you know, we could take maybe one more question, guys. Just let me know, uh, Vajahat and Muid. I mean, are you, do you have? Yeah, Vajahat, yeah. yeah. I'll listen, I'll, then I'll leave afterwards. Yeah. Okay, and then because we do have one last question in terms of for both of you, what role do you have or what guidance do you have for Pakistani Americans, the Pakistani diaspora, um, in terms of what more they could be doing to sort of support this effort? Okay. So I so I just, think Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, so I, I it's been interesting to see. I just moved here like uh, four years ago and I've uh, studied in the US before. I've lived in the US before. I was for college and grad school. But when I moved for five years now almost, um I started realizing that the diaspora is essentially decentralized. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing just generally because people do their own stuff. But at a moment like this, when there's a, a urgent uh, national imperative, um, you can see how that doesn't work. It's uh, interesting to see um, initiatives, independent initiatives like this one, uh, like the CAPJ, which is your initiative, um, where there's uh, Sharyar and I met outside a Asia Society um, lecture, and uh, we just hit it off, and we started our own initiative. God knows how many people have started their own initiatives, but nothing is centralized. Um, we need to start talking about centralizing the initiatives and uh, the diaspora. That's a conversation to have. It's a very long conversation, but it needs to start. That's one. Number two is that the diaspora in its independent capacity also needs to start uh, really, really um, uh, thinking about how it has failed to really make its presence felt uh, in Washington, um, as well as in the academy, in the media here, et cetera. It's quite sad that if this was, for example, happening in Iran, uh, it would be, and it is happening in Iran, and we've seen the Iranians in action recently, uh, they're pretty organized. They get on TV. They get they get the press. They get people moving fast. And God forbid if this was happening in India, my God, my God, there would be a Netflix series about Modi right now if this was happening to Modi right now. In fact, it would be a second season of the Netflix series right now. We'd be watching it, right? So, which which takes me to wonder, uh, which makes me wonder that where did we go wrong as a diaspora? And I think that we. Uh, started, we are a very uh, generous bunch. We are a very passionate bunch, but uh, we um, uh, you would rather uh, contribute to making uh, a masjid or a hospital or a mosque 
and rich and tick off that rich guilt zakat box in our head and in our tax forms and walk away from the crime scene i think pakistanis have generally failed at uh, appreciating the role that public policy and the academy plays uh, in these great united states uh, for example for the people watching um i would rather that you contribute to the qaid e azam chair at columbia university uh, which is the only dedicated uh, chair uh, in recent history it's been vacant now for almost 10 years by the way because uh, the pakistani government doesn't want um uh, pakistani scholars to come and participate in the national conversation and think about pakistan there's a pakistan chair in berkeley which is also empty because the there's no pakistan chairs. Uh, no pakistani government and across the world there's nine chairs lse mein lots of schools cambridge so there's, there's 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 um there's the academy now the pakistanis the pakistani government has failed they, they but they failed on so many things so we can't blame them but where are we at in that um there's also a serious dearth in terms of um if you really have money to spare so instead of giving it to your local congressman so he comes in meets your wife meets your kids takes a picture with you which you put in the foyer and then leaves and gives you one tweet which doesn't amount to much and it costs you 50 60 dollars. well guess what 50 60 dollars will get you probably um, a fellow or a junior fellow or some sort of grad student in some think tank uh, in washington probably for a year who will be who will dedicate his or her life for one year to debating military reforms or investigating the path forward 100%. or talk, or talking about climate change your 50 dollars uh, are better are better used in a place like the atlantic council or the wilson center or the stimson center or the carnegie foundation that is how by the way the indians really played their game we keep on naturally comparing ourselves to indians we should because we were the same country once and they're a much better country now by almost every standard not all standards but almost every standard premised on that we need to learn from the best we shouldn't take like we're not like the saudi diaspora very bad very bad comparison because they have different power levels we shouldn't compare ourselves to the chinese diaspora they have different power levels the closest example is right next door and this is how they started and within 20 years when the indians entered the lobbying business the, the in in washington the influence business in washington they knocked on the think tank door yeah. and they they knocked on the university academic door sure. and those doors by the way you don't need this these are not underhanded backroom deals you can yeah. right now take a hundred thousand dollar check to your favorite think tank and say hey here's a hundred thousand dollars i want you to study i don't know uh the slums of karachi okay yeah. because i don't like the slums of, and and you know what guess what they'll do they will study the slums of karachi for you for two years because that's what their job is hmm. except people would rather people would rather in this country and i i keep on seeing the diaspora really waste its time and money and there's nothing wrong with tcf there's nothing wrong in making the new wing in nishtar hospital good good make a hospital make a school make a mosque but do it on your own time and time if you really want to contribute and are worried about what's really happening to the political economy of your, of this country and its relations with that country then the best way to influence american opinion american policy as a pakistani american is to knock on the front doors of the american academy and the american think tank system they will get you presence and a footprint in washington and Those that it, and i didn't invent this the indians did <laughs> the, Israel, the, Israel, the Israelis did. They've already done. Yeah, we done can replicate it. that. Absolutely. No, those are excellent points. Thank you so much for that, Bajahat, and it gives us a lot to think about. And um, I will give you, uh, Muid, the last word on this. If you could, you know, um, how much do you agree with Bajahat, and also what are your? You've also been analyzing the Pakistani diaspora quite a bit in their initiatives. First of all, um, uh, I agree with Bajahat. I think he has made some very valid points. I just want to add this thing that this is an election year within United States. Uh, this is first election year in united states and for own reasons the pakistani community is politically agitated because of pakistan also because of the gaza situation and the pakistani community 
and also this is very decentralized as the Jahad said. This is the high time for the Pakistani community to basically think that how can they centralize? How can they create platforms that bring them together? There are uh, there are elements of community within exactly. Boston, in Chicago, yeah. in New York, in Los Angeles, in Houston, in Dallas, and Ohio. How do they basically create some platforms that bring them together and make the American system realize that we have also arrived? And how can they make the American political system realize that we matter? So far, they don't matter. They are actually giving, say, $10,000 for a dinner and maybe $50,000 for a tweet, but that's what's happening. These are transactional relationships. They have not created a cerebral, mental, and intellectual relationship with the American social and political system. They have also not opened up their homes to other non-Muslim Americans. Wherever I've gone, I've seen so much so that I, you know, in Maine, I've seen that they always segregate the men and women. I mean, in everywhere in United States, I've seen just like Pakistan, the men, in fact, in Islamabad, it doesn't happen. In many places in Islamabad, men and women are sitting together. But here in United States, just like in the UK, I see the Pakistani diaspora, the women are sitting on one side, the men are sitting on the other side. Ek zanana hai, ek mardana hai. Uh, in year 2024 of this, so ye, this is a lot of regression. But I have to leave. Uh, you know, we were supposed to be till 1230. We should have another sitting at some time. And Absolutely. And guys, you know, event. no, and you guys have given such great ideas. I think our next conversation should be about bringing different diaspora initiatives and having a conversation with them and see how they can be more synergized um, in their relations. So, but I would just like to, on behalf of everybody who joined, I'd like to thank Vajahat and Moeed and Gibran, who's left so much. This was incredible, incisive analysis. You guys gave us so much to think about. And thank you so much for your generosity of time and spirit for being here. Um, I will leave our audience with just one ask, and, and that is to please, at this point, please call your representatives and ask them to co-sponsor House Resolution 901. It expresses support for democracy and human rights at a very critical moment in Pakistan's history. If you'd like to know more about how you can reach out to your reps, please um, visit our website, CA4PJ. CA4 as in the number 4 pj.org um, and we would love to connect you and um, and again please stay in touch I'd also like to thank our CAPJ and TPQ team Shahiyar Munawar uh, Anna Mughal Sarvat Shafi Bhai and everybody who um, helped put this together on such short notice um, again thank you all so much you will get a video of this and again um, have a great rest of the weekend Thanks. Thank and you. a big shout out thank to you. all of you as well. Thanks. Baraka, thank you. Shay, thanks. Anam, thanks. And uh, especially to Shafi Saab, thank you. Thank you. Thank see you, Good to see you. Good to see you, Zabran. I'll call you offline. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.